So many people are looking to live happier, more stress-free lives. We provide interviews from mental health experts across various fields because we know finding quality information isn't always easy. Let's find more sanity together. Hello and welcome everybody back to Sanity Podcast. We have Dr. Craig Henderson here. Uh, he's coming in to talk to us about family-based treatment for adolescent substance abuse um, and other related disorders. Uh, Craig was actually a guest uh, earlier on, one of the first podcasts. If you want to hear more about his background, it will be in the bio for the show notes, but also you could check back on that last episode to hear more about um, Craig's expertise and some of the work that he's done. So Craig, thanks so much for coming back on the show. Yeah, you're welcome. Happy to be here, Jason. Um, yeah. It's fantastic uh, because this is a big issue that um, maybe we're not talking enough about, which is substance abuse issues in teens. Right. Um, so, so what's the nature of the stage here with uh, substance abuse in, in teenagers and are people giving it enough attention? Um, it's not good, to be totally honest. Uh, um, you know, I, I, and I'm sure this isn't a surprise to many of your listeners, Um uh, COVID has messed with us in some really, you know, bad ways and and we're still recovering and adjusting, you know, fortunately things are a a little safer to get out and around, you know, I'm back at my university teaching face-to-face things like this. That's great. But there are some ramifications and ripple effects from that, that seem to be affecting our kids, uh, uh, in, in some really profound ways. Uh, you know, you, you, you see, um, increased prevalence in anxiety, depressive disorders. I don't know if you, uh, have seen the new, uh, CDC report that came out about, uh, females, adolescent females and, and the, uh, just really difficult situations they're encountering with respect to, um, assaults, PTSD, along with depression and anxiety. Um, And we've seen, it's kind of uh, gone a little bit under the radar, but uh, drug overdose rates are up. That's the case uh, across age groups. Um, And um, yeah, we're we're, we're facing a real challenge here. Uh, In in my state in in particular, I'm in uh, Texas, Texas Tribune, which is a really strong uh, publication here, um, covers, you know, news articles daily. Uh, Their their lead article was on how under-resourced we are as a state when it comes to mental health. And uh, mental health and substance use go hand in hand. Um, You know, you you see things that are happening. in the schools uh, and, you know, shootings. I I mean, one of those happened, well, Texas is a big state, but you you still feel it, you know, with the uh, Uvalde massacre. Um, Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, not to be so, you know, present this aura of gloom or anything. I I, I just think we are facing some really uh, tough challenges and our youth, seem to be affect, uh, affected more than just about anyone else. Hmm. Um, and you had brought up that CC report. Well, what does CC stand for? Just for oh, people? CDC, Center for oh, CDC. Disease Control. Oh, yeah. okay, yeah, yeah. that makes a lot of sense. Okay, about Center that. for Disease Control. No, no, that's all right. And so, uh, I mean, I, I think that's really interesting. Well, what are some of the things that the CDC were saying in this recent report? So the, kind of the headline was the number uh, of young women who are reporting um, sexual assaults and uh, PTSD. It's just, you know, at um, uh, much higher levels than they have been in previous reports. Okay. So, I I mean, it's more than just a substance abuse issue. I mean, that's part of it. And of course, as mental health gets worse, substance abuse problems go up um, with it. But it seems like there is a, I'm not sure if if crisis is the right word, or maybe you think crisis is the right word, but there's definitely a rise in adolescent mental health issues going on 
nationwide. Um, and it sounds like COVID played uh, at least a role in that. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, and I see it too. It, uh, you know, I, I am a university. Um, I work at a university in a psychology department, uh, spend a good amount of time in our community-based clinic. We provide services to a number of college students. Um, referrals are up, uh, you know, uh, uh, just a high number of our students are dealing with particularly anxiety and depression. Mm. And so, so you feel and, and, like there's been an influx at the at the the clinic that that uh, the student uh, the therapists work at. Yeah, yeah, there 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 certainly has been, um, and it seems that way all around. And, and the you know, as you said, you can't look at mental health and substance use as wow. these separate topics. I mean, they clearly impact one another. Um, you know, in our, you know, a number of young people are, are are using substances to be able to cope with these mental health issues that they're facing, um, and, and that's a particularly uh, more dangerous route long term because it seems like um, drinking to cope or substance use to cope motives seem to uh, predict longer term uh, substance use problems. Mm. Um. I remember, and, and this is a while ago, and you know much more about this than I do, but I remember a research study where they looked at um, relapse uh, for for uh, substance users. And one of the main factors in this study was the faith that I could handle my my, my problems. And so mm -hmm. when people mm -hmm. felt like they could handle their problems, they were far less likely to try and use a substance to feel better. But when you felt like you couldn't handle your problems, there's nothing I could do and I'm in pain, so I need something to help take the pain away. And it actually links in um, to the theoretical orientation in CBT, that uh, cognitive behavioral therapy that, that I follow, that a major component of anxiety and depression and mental distress is this idea that I can't handle things. I can't cope or navigate mm -hmm. situations or, or deal with, uh, with the emotional state. And that's a big thing that we work on in, in therapy. Uh, so it, it's maybe an interesting mechanism here mm -hmm. going, going underlying both of them. Yeah, yeah, I, I I would agree with that. Um, you know, and as it comes to to youth building resilience, I I, I think um, yeah, it's interesting how you say that 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 there was a an ability a perceived ability to manage one's life circumstances that is now placed under threat and questioning that. Um, and uh, at least in the study you mentioned, this seemed to be a, a, an inroad into substance use. Well, into, into relapse. So when yeah. they got okay. people relapse treatment, specifically. yeah, mm -hmm. they got into treatment, they got out, they were sober, who was more likely to relapse or not for this particular study. Yeah. 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 That, ma that, that makes a lot of sense. Um, and with young people, it, it, it's looking at, you know, certainly um, treating these mental health, substance use uh, uh, problems, but yeah, you know, building some resilience, re restoring some confidence in the be ability to cope with uh, life circumstances. And it it's easy to see how that's really been questioned with the types of things that are that have happened in our uh, world recently. Mm -hmm. And what do you mean by that? Like, what are some of the things well, that you're talking about? Just uh, uncontrollable types of events, you know, a, a, a worldwide pandemic that no one um, expected, you know, huge, and the impact that's had in, in terms of huge disruptions to our social networks, um, you know, in, in, in many kind uh, cases, uh, stressing family dynamics. Um, you know, you, you, you see it with the angst uh, expressed at the community level. Again, like in, in, in my home state, in my, my particular community, we're dealing with issues about um, uh, the library and, and the library holdings and, and just this, you know, angsty kind of 
moment there that we're in and uh, looking to reestablish some sense of control. Um, and uh, of course, our, our, our kids are going to get caught up in that, too. Mm -hmm. And then, and then, of course, I mean, the economy impacts everybody. And then so we come out of COVID and then there's war international on the international stage, inflation, things like that. Um, and then, as you mentioned, there's, you know, continuous shootings that happen. And particularly when you're the ones that are attending those schools, uh, right. you know, I mean, that that's something that, of course, would probably increase your reasonably increase your stress level. Exactly. Um, yeah. But I, I think it brings a good notion here that I think oftentimes people uh, blame people for having substance abuse disorders. And, and I, I'm not um, like talking about erasing full culpability or or going the other direction, but just the idea that like um, it's more of a choice than than what it might what it might be. Um, but when you think about an adolescent that's going through difficult um mental health issues going on, maybe there's family problems, maybe there's stresses, and they don't have the resources. And I'm not talking about the internal resources. I'm talking about like external, like mm -hmm. I'm in psychological pain. Um, mm -hmm. I don't know what to do with it. And I don't know where to get help, or I can't afford to get help, or there's not mm -hmm. help available. Um, you, you know, it seems very reasonable that somebody would then say, I need to numb it out somehow. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, using substances, and I think that that very much connects into what you're what you're saying here. But I don't know how often people really think about it like that. Yeah, yeah, no, you're you're absolutely right. And, and you have on top of that, let's say, you know, someone does find a place where they can numb some of it out, or you know, there's a peer group where they they feel good and a part of, and you know, part of one of the activities the, this group engages in is, you know, drinking or substance use, things like that. It's, it's easy to see how, you know, young people. Yeah. And the, the, the choice is definitely a very relative term on top of that. You know, we have research that's showing that over time and with continuous use, um, there are, you know, morphological changes and uh, biochemical changes in the brain that, um, you know, change motivational states. So uh, the active choice element becomes more and more diminished over time. Mm -hmm. So like literally because of the structural changes, um, mm -hmm. they have, uh, what, do you, what do you mean by that motivational change? Well, just that um, motivation is driven to uh, maintain the, the, those uh, same, you know, mental and physiological states. So I, I see what you're saying. So like literally the structural chains motivates for substance use. Yes. Substance and, use. and um, you know, uh, biochemical changes that are happening there as well. Yep. Okay. All right. Um, any other major factors that you want to highlight besides the societal, you know, pressures that are going on, uh, and, and mental health that might be increasing the amount of substance use in teens right now? Yeah. I, I don't know if so much in, in increasing it, but it, you know, my, my, um, the work I've done is on family-based treatments. So, mm -hmm. um, the family you know, it, it, research is very clear. Um, you know, there, there, there are certain things that, that stress and may uh, increase re, uh, risk for substance use, but it can also be a, a, a source and a locus of healing and, and um, uh, support uh, as a young person kind of navigates their way through you know, our, our, our circumstances in life. So uh, the family can be a powerful healing force as well. And that that's uh, a lot of the work that uh, I've been involved with um, is, you know, showing that, showing that in, in um, uh, a number of different contexts and on la larger scales. Hmm. Um, and the, the fam family therapy or, or doing a family treatment approach is empirically supported, meaning that there's research to show that it's effective in helping adolescent substance use. 
w- would you say that it is the like primary therapy that we should be going to, or it's one uh, therapy that works that we should definitely keep in the repertoire with other therapies uh, yeah. that that are known to work? Yeah. So I, I, family therapy is the the research is clear. They they do work. In, in fact, they have the strongest track record of research support of therapies out there. Now, it, it's not uh, the only, um, you know, treatment that's been shown effective. We, we um, uh, along with some colleagues, uh, we published a, um, a review paper in the uh, Journal of uh, Clinical Child and Adolescent Psychology in, uh, I think our latest update was in 2019. And um, shows that family therapies have the strongest track record of support, have been used uh, the most broadly, kind of as it migrates out of research, university, you know, heavy research types of settings into more um, uh, usual care, what, what, what's happening in general in, in, in the treatment landscape there. Um, uh, it, it's kind of led the way in, in terms of the uh, dissemination and implementation of these research supported um, treatments as well. There are certainly others. CBT uh, is effective with uh, young people as with substance use disorders, as well as adults. Um, motivational interviewing, of course, has shown some promise. Uh, screening and brief intervention seems to be a, a, a real um, gaining some uh, significance in, in, in the field. Um, and I, I see that as being a really, in being able to, screen and do some brief interventions in um, novel kind of contexts and be able to um, capture and get access to more people, you know, for instance, primary care, primary care settings and uh, school settings. So um, there are a number of those out there. Uh, you know, again, the family-based approach seems to have the strongest track record uh, of research support. And that, that that's the one that I've done most of my work in. Mm -hmm. Um, so I, I think pretty much everybody knows what family therapy is, right. But it, it, um, there's a specific therapies that are going on here when we're talking about, when you're talking about family-based treatments. Um, so what are these family-based there? Like, what are the components? What do they look like? Uh, what makes them unique or work? So within family-based therapies, there's a, a strain called, um, which we called in this review article, uh, ecologically focused family therapies. And what is common in these, there, there's work together as a family, um, uh, this idea of uh, bettering and, and healing relationships that may be uh, under strain, providing parents with uh, better parenting skills. Uh, the, the, one of these that I'm most familiar with is going to be multidimensional family therapy. And there is a heavy component there that's individual therapy with the adolescent as well, and as well working with the parent in, uh, or parents, caregivers in issues outside of their parenting. What, what, is stressing them in life. Mm. So, um, so you have uh, individual work for both uh, on the adolescent and the parent. You have work in, in terms of improving family relationships. And then you have uh, therapist um, and uh, what are called therapist uh, assistants uh, wh who do a fair amount of what you might think of as a case management type of work, working in external systems that um, influence the the child and the family interactions with each other like you know examples would be schools uh and so working in schools to make sure you know kids are getting the most out of those uh, as possible maybe uh working some with their uh peer groups working uh with court systems um those type of things so uh as the term connotes, it, it, it's, uh, you're working with a whole social ecology of, uh, these young people and, and their families. Mm -hmm. 
So it sounds like a major component here um, is reducing stress across the system or yeah, problems exactly. across the system, having the family operate better, working with the school to get those things operate better. H- how much is the intervention um, focus on the substance use rather than creating a healthier system around the individual to decrease like sort of the need to use? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, and and let, let, let me go back to something you said just real quick. It's intervening in those er- areas, but it's also careful assessment in those areas. So having a, a strong you know, understanding of all the, the numerous areas uh, of uh, uh, adolescent and, and their families' lives and the number of different uh, things that could be impinging on them and increasing you know, either their risk for substance use or uh, in some ways uh, providing some protection against it. So assessment is really um, uh, core to that. And um, yeah, so so particularly if we're talking about substance use, so early family therapies, uh, looking at work of um, like uh, Salvador Mnuchin, Jay Haley, some of the early pi- pioneers, um, uh, the Palo Alto Research Group, there, there, there was this thought that you, you fix what's in the family, you fix the family dynamics, and it will take care of the symptoms or the problems that, that are being expressed. And, and, you know, there is something to that. I mean, we certainly want to heal family dynamics, um, you know, strengthen the protection, help parents be better parents, help them be more aware of what you know their their adolescents are are doing having the adolescents be able to be open to their parents being more open to these things i i mean a lot of that is you know just really fostering stronger relationships and family dynamics but with substance use yeah you got to address the substance use issue on, you know, directly. Um, uh, We have in previous um, uh, research studies that I've been involved with, we've had the therapist uh, uh, do drug screening for the kids. And there has to be open discussions about substance use. The the therapists absolutely need to know uh, what you know, these kids are using, who they're using with, these types of things. So there are, you know, the uh, kind of old um, school drug counseling and and, uh, approaches that it it has developed and shown uh, effective come into play in this family um, setting. Mm -hmm. I, you know, I, I think one one thing I was like nailing on the head before is this idea of mental health and stress being a, a component of um, substance abuse. But I, I mean, I, I, I'm assuming there's other motivators as to why why teens get um, get hooked on on using a substance. Um, what, what are some other factors that you guys might be working on here in order to get someone to the other side? Um. <clears throat> yeah, help, help me understand that a little more, Jason. Sorry. Yeah. So, you know, you, you brought up a, a good point before where you said, well, you know, sometimes there's a friend group that they're that someone's a part mm-hmm. of and it's more it's recreational and to fit in using drugs is part of it. And that might not necessarily be uh, fully stress mediated, meaning that uh, the person is depressed or anxious or is having um, significant family problems, but more more being pulled into um, a social situation. So I was just wondering, just because I, we did talk so much about mental health before, if there's other factors that lead people, teens, to starting to abuse drugs or getting hooked on yeah, drugs. Yeah, I got you. Well, I, I mean, being a teen yourself, I, I, I was once one. We, we know <laughs> uh, from lived experience how influential peer groups can be. Um, mm-hmm. And as we navigate uh, those teen years, as we move, from less of a direct influence of parents in our lives and less, you know, of a controlling, you know, to more uh, a- autonomy or what we call um, interdependence. So we, we're, we're not, you know, certainly dependence is no longer going to be something that's going to be workable where the, 
you know, kids are dependent on their parents. Independence, you know, full independence, independence is not a optimal goal until uh, a young person has the capacity to live uh, an independent, li- independent life, has developed, um, you know, frontal lobes in particularly and life skills to be able to do that. So we talk about it, uh, about an interdependence between uh, uh, parents and adolescents as they negotiate these types of things. But sure, I mean, that changes over time. So yeah, uh, youth are really susceptible to peer influence, you know, and, and for some of these kids, you know, I do a good uh, amount of evaluations for uh, kids who are involved in the justice system. Sometimes it's just they're caught, you know, at the wrong time, just like poor luck, basically. <laughs> and mm-hmm. um, I, I, I'm laughing because I think there there are probably some times in my own adolescence, had I been caught at the right time, you know, my uh, life could be much different. So um but uh, you, you look at those things and you, you, you see, you know, identifying with a peer group, okay? And some amount of what, what we've learned from the research is some amount of experimentation is developmentally normative, okay? Mm-hmm. It happens, you know? Um, I, I would be lying to you if I were to sit here and tell you that that was not a part of my adolescent hood at all. You know, it was. And for most people, um, you know, that is the case. But when you put in things, when you add additional stressors, let's say a kid's having um, difficulty in school or let's say has a learning problem or or is just struggling and aren't getting the help they need, you know, that that's such an important influence on kids' lives. So, you know, um, like this stuff is not fun. I'm getting bummed out like by this. Why don't I, you know, hang out with these people who make me feel better and do fun things, you know, family conflict, you know, getting out, out, uh, you know, I I don't want to be at home because I'm always fighting with my dad or my mom or whoever, you know? Um, So these types of things can orient a kid who maybe starts out with experimenting, but, it becomes a more powerful influence in uh, their lives as problems in other areas of their life start piling up. Does that make sense? Mm. Yeah. And I, I think that uh, really flushes out a description of the different areas where you were talking about a family therapy, where you might need to jump in uh, to help yeah. here. Like if somebody has a learning disability or they're not doing so well in school, maybe it hasn't been identified yet. Right. Or maybe they have ADHD or something like that, and it's working to figure that out in order to get them the resources they need in order to actually perform better um, in school, right? And then that might not be talking about the substances directly, but that's going to then decrease the need to abuse substances as one exactly in a multifactorial system. Exactly. Exactly. Yes. And that is where the multidimensional comes from in multidimensional family therapies. I mean, one of the core tenets is there are a lot of pathways in to problematic substance use, and there are several different pathways out. And um, those for an individual kid are going to be individually determined. So. Mm-hmm. Yeah, uh, something else that you uh, were, were just saying kind of reminds me of that there's a really strong research in the developmental psychopathology of adolescent substance use. And, and that's just kind of a fancy, you know, researchy type of term that looks at how problems like substance use problems develop over one's life course, Um, you know, and and it's these types of things, uh, uh, school problems, uh, problems at home, um, peer groups, identifying with a more antisocial peer group. Uh, These types of things as they develop over time uh, lead to a pathway, which includes problematic substance use. Hmm. Um, And I'm not sure if that research like ended at adolescence, like, you know, if they said 18 and we're done looking or, or do these factors like kind of stay the same as we're going through adulthood or as we develop the, the risk factors change? Yeah. Yeah. It, it, it's interesting. They, they, they do change to a certain degree over time. I, I don't know if you're looking at a whole new set of risk factors necessarily, but the impact of some over others, um, 
uh, and, and yeah, no, it, it, but it, it is your, your, your observation there is a, a, a bit humorous to me because we did used to treat it that way. Like we looked at things like adolescence up through 18, and then we picked up an adulthood, which is somewhere in the thirties. And, and for a long time, we were missing what, what, what's happening in those early adult years. And that, that, that's some of the work that I'm involved in uh, now as well. And there's been some really strong work. Uh, Ashley Shadow and others have done uh, work looking at family-based uh, treatment for that, uh, you know, early adulthood or emerging, uh, emerging adulthood. Adult. Yeah, yeah. I think, yeah. I think it's a good term emerging adult. Yeah. 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 I, I, I like it as well. Yeah. We're, we're uh, currently, we, we received some, um, uh, funding from the National Institute on Drug Abuse to do to set up a uh, basically a research network. Um, we're looking at um, uh, Aaron Hogue at the Partnership to End Addiction is the um, uh, principal investigator on this. There are a, a number of other people uh, involved. Uh, Sarah Becker, who's at uh, Northwestern, uh, Sharon Levy at uh, Boston Children's Hospital. Uh, Mark Fishman and Kevin Wenzel uh, are, are leading a, a, a really unique um, treatment program in the Baltimore area. Um, but we're, we're kind of joining forces and developing this research network where one of the things that we're doing is looking at bringing um, family-based treatments for, specifically for opioid use uh to emerging adults okay and the type of things that we the 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 ways that you would interact with a a family and influence them in treatment for uh, a 15 year old is going to look much different for a you know 25 26 year old um but it's uh they they've done kevin and mark in kevin uh wenzel and mark fishman in particular have done some really strong work looking at what's effective for those uh for bringing family influence in to um uh, the emerging ad adult mm -hmm. uh stage of development yeah um the, the job is not done after uh 25 for your parents out there right yeah, 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 yeah. I, I, I've got a 22 year old and, I, you know, um, and then 18 year old uh, starting college in the fall. So and yeah, my, my, my job as a parent is not done. It looks quite a bit. Yeah, yeah. Far, but, far, uh, far from done. Um, you know, the uh, the research on the reverse U curve of happiness, like you're happiest when you're a kid. And then when you get to that, like, you know, 40s to 50s, you tend to be the least happy. That's when it kind of dips and then you pull back up. Um, afterwards and I, i'll talk to um parents with adult kids that have kids going into their 30s and into their 40s um you know the depression feeling like um what are my goals now what's mm -hmm. my utility and things like that mm -hmm. and oftentimes mm -hmm. they say your, your job as a parent is not is not done <laughs> you, no. you know you're, you're this i know that your kids are adult adults um yeah but th this is still a hard time for them and you navigated this before and so don't uh, downplay your importance in helping your kids get through it now. <clears throat> and I think it goes to show just um, to this point of family therapy, uh, the importance of family through the lifetime in mediating stress and problems, mm -hmm. um, mental health issues and things like that. Because oftentimes when we think about parents and family, we're thinking, of, uh, thinking about teens. And that's why I'm kind of going down this rift a little mm -hmm. bit. So we think about teens, you think about kids. Um, but it's a be beautiful thing that they're saying, Hey, what about these 25 year olds? Do their yeah. parents still matter? Does family still matter? Uh, what about 30 year olds? What, what about people that are, have life partners and have kids and are settled down? What, what about people that are, um, 45, 50 year, years old, uh, even, um, elderly patients, I would imagine their families are really important too, and their, their mental health as well. So, um, you know, just encouraging people not to think that the buck stops when the kids go to college or when they graduate college in, in the factor of, of helping out in treatment. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And, and you know, speaking now as a parent, um, every, you know, stage of life seems to bring its own challenges and its own joys. And, and you know, working, working hard to, uh, be experiencing a little bit more of the joy and less of the problems. So, um, 
but yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, we're, we're right in it with that 22 year old trying not to be, you know, overbearing, uh, <laughs> you know, uh, ride them too hard, but, uh, you know, a- a- having some influence there as well. And yeah. I-, I-, I think that rings true to life with families, you know, a number of families across the country, across cultures, you know, you, you have those core types of things. Um, mm-hmm. But you're right. Yeah, we we, we can. T- the, uh, another thing and sorry, this is kind of a, a little off track here. That's but a, another thing, like, we're dealing with like people in my stage of life, you, you still have parenting responsibilities and influence and, and, you know, worry about your kids. And more and more, we're also being called to take care of our parents in some ways, you yep. know. Um, uh, so that, that that's a particular uh, challenge as well. I uh, My father died a little over a year ago, and uh, my mom is not as, um, you know, she, 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 you know, has some diminished capacity as well. Um, and she, you know, she's just hurting. And, and a lot of my, you know, the help and support I can provide for her is just simply uh, companion, companionship and, you know, care. Uh, but yeah, be, being called more uh, in that direction as well. So. Yeah. I, um, I often um, say, say to parents that are feeling like, Oh, I messed up here. I messed up there. Like, like for you, this is the first time that you've ever been a parent to a 22 year old, right? It's not like you've done this 50 times and that you right. parented a 20. So you're learning as you're going um, as well. And I think there's some grace to be had around that, that, you know, you mm. don't, you don't know how to parent an eight year old necessarily until you've had an eight year old, unless you've, I mean, some people have experience with that where they grew up with younger siblings or they're in a community where that happened. But a lot of people, um, didn't, didn't interact much with raising kids. Uh, yeah. and all of a sudden there's a kid in their lap and they're trying to figure it out. Um, so yeah, parenting my, my, itself has its own stresses. Uh, for sure. Too. Yeah. My, my, my two, um, you know, rules for parenting. Uh, you know, I, I've got a lot to learn <laughs> about this, but, uh, my two rules are love your kid and don't freak out. <laughs> love your kid and don't freak out. Yeah. Um, yeah. so I don't know. I mean, we, we could jump back to the therapy part of it, but I, I, it just makes a lot of sense. I think just hearing like this conversation that, that, that we just had here, I think people could intuit, you know, if they're like, Oh, well, why not just do individual, um, maybe you could intuit that feeling as to why it's important to pull these people from your support system um, in. Yeah. Yeah. So I I would say two things. One is, um, you know, kind of use a researchy type of term again, but ecological validity. If you can work with people in, in, in the settings in which they live their lives, I think it's going to be, I mean, there's less of a translation, like what happens, you know, in the therapy room versus outside, there's less of a translation there. A lot of our work, and this isn't unique to us, a lot of these research supported family therapies are, you know, they're doing the work in the homes. So there you can see firsthand and you can also influence what's happening in, in, you know, those natural environments, but you also have access to, a number of different um, influences that that in shape those developmental pathways a, as uh, young people uh, grow and develop through life. Um, so, so those are the two things that that I think of a, a family base. Um, the family therapy really gives you is uh, more direct ac- access and a wider sphere of influence. Mm-hmm. Um, th- this might be a curveball, uh, and you know, usually when you research something, you're just trying to understand the thing that you're doing before you jump out of the box and start looking at the things outside of it. Uh, but but you know, there's a lot of adolescents, and I mean, just across the lifespan, where they have they're estranged from their family, or they don't have this traditional family mm-hmm. nucleus that that you think about. Um, does the therapy compensate for that? Like, does the therapy pull in close friends or mentors or coaches? Like, like what if that's not there? Have, have you guys gotten uh, to look into that realm yet? Or are you still just plugging away at trying to figure out this core thing before you jump off to offshoots? 
Yeah, yeah. No, I, I, that's definitely happening. Um, so the, the work that I was uh, talking with you about that's happening in um, Baltimore, uh, they're looking at families of choice. It, it, it's not, you know, and, and you can see like at 23, 24, 25 years old, you have a lot more choice in who your family is going to be. And uh, this work is working with those meaningful relationships. I, I mean, who are the people that have uh, influences? Are, are you know, uh, what are relationships with parents like? If that, you know, if not that, then um, uh, what about extended family? What about partners? What about you know other family members of choice? So it, it, it's quite flexible in that in that regard. I have a student here uh, who, who's working with me now. Um, uh, you know, she, she's pretty early on, but she's, um, you know, thinking about dissertation topics down the road and stuff. And one of the things that she is wanting to, one of the possibilities she can go in is developing measures of family functioning, but with families of choice rather than um, biological. So, uh, yeah, yeah. So, so it's quite, it's as family functions, not as it's strictly uh, biologically defined. Hmm. Okay. I mean, that's great, right? Because you want to be as inclusive and you also want to be pulling in the people that are going to have the biggest impact on people's lives that are having the, the biggest influence. So maybe in the future, they're going to change the term family. Uh, the, you know, uh, who knows? All right, certainly, so, certainly yeah. it, it's much more inclusive now than you know, it has ever been. So mm -hmm. sorry, um, I, I think I interrupted you. you had oh, a... no, no, that's okay. I, I was just saying, so we, we talked about the different areas of intervention and not that we have to go like super deep into it, but for people that are like, well, what does this actually look like in the room? Or like, what are the active ingredients here? Um, what, what are, what are the mechanism of change? Like, what are you trying to do? Like in CBT, we might do an exposure or we might do a thought log or mm -hmm. a behavioral experiment you know, or, or something like looking at core beliefs, things like that. Like, what are mm -hmm. you actually doing in the room to promote the change in these different identified areas? Or maybe even if you just want to focus on just the family, the family system itself or the individual. Um, yeah, might yeah. Be more useful. R really good question. Um, so I'll, I'll answer that in a couple of ways with, with work that I've been involved with. So, um, uh, I, I mentioned my uh, friend and colleague, Aaron Hogue, earlier. We've been, you know, working together for about 20 years now. And part of what w one emphasis is, uh, of this work has been going from research developed models that, that you know, kind of where there's a lot more... Uh, um, development and influence of the direct uh, um, treatment developers moving. So, well, a, a, as we talk about the field, moving more from research settings to these applied settings. So one of the things that we've been doing is working in what w we call it usual care settings. A and usual care would be like, you know, basically treatment, community centers, you know, uh, medical school, it, it's where you would go to get care, you know, mo where, where most folks would go to, to get care, basically. So we're, we're kind of like from research settings to more um, care as it's happening out there in the world. So usual care. So that, that's been one strain of the work. Another strain is um, identifying what are what what we call as the core elements of uh effective practice and th th this has been done in, in cbt work as well i i mean mm -hmm. uh look at uh the unified protocol for example it, it, it's an a, a really good example of taking you know research supported work and uh in a empirically responsible way, identifying what are, you know, core to helping people change. Um, well, this work is being done in, uh, we, we've been doing this in family-based treatments as well, starting with, um, you know, original uh, 
uh, treatments, the, 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 the first treatments that we're developing, um, research support and identifying what's common across them. We have, um, uh, we've identified in, in the work we've done four main areas. So, um, uh, interactional change. So this is influence or working directly with uh, family uh, direct interactions, influencing how uh, those happen a, a bit differently. Developing you know better communication approaches, um, uh, you know, softening tone, uh, working towards something more uh, supportive, um, but somehow directly influencing uh, family uh, interactions. The second is uh, relational reframe. So, you know, a, a lot of times parents will think, um, you know, my kid's having problems. This is their problem. You know, um, this substance use is my kid's thing. Uh, and reframing it in a more relational context. And in some uh, sense, giving um, parents some agency in you, you can't, you, you are probably the most effective uh, agent of change in this kid's life. And maybe also from the kid's point of view of, you know, developing an alliance with the treatment provider that, that, that shows, okay, this person's going to be on my side in some of these issues that I'm running into in my family. So interactional change, uh, relational reframe, a third is engagement. In particular, uh, what, what we found, uh, at least in the original work that we did, is, is that adolescent engagement is, is really important. Although um, have a uh, colleague, um, you know, part of this work group who I, I've uh, talked about, her name is uh, Nicole Porter, and her um, doctoral dissertation, which uh, is, she's going to be submitting for um, to peer review soon is looking at parent engagement as well. So uh, engagement um, in what? Uh, what? Sorry, engaging in treatment. Okay, so with adolescents, it's like showing them there's something in this for you, and, and it uh, getting their buy-in. Basically, what what, okay. what we've seen is that's particularly important with adolescents. Some of Nicole's work is looking at it from the parent standpoint. So uh, getting the parents involved as part of the treatment, developing a, a working alliance with them. So um, yeah, so interactional change, relational reframe, adolescent engagement, and then um, uh, a fourth is relational emphasis. So working on uh, kind of a broader uh, family relationships. Um, uh, some things here, uh, we, we actually extracted uh, specific items from uh, treatment fidelity measures, those being uh, measures that are used in research studies to uh, make sure that, um, you know, the therapists are delivering the treatment like uh, they're, they're supposed to be delivering it. So uh, examples from a relational emphasis are, are asking clarifying questions and focusing on family process or enhancing family communication and attachment, things like that. Okay. All right. Um, and j just like um, any empirically supported treatment out there, right, there's the theory behind it. Um, but we have the way that the therapy should be operating. Uh, we phrase it like that. And then in order to do the research, right, because there has to be some sort of uh, unified way that we're doing it so we can measure it. Mm -hmm. You know, so for example, if you're measuring weight and then you're having one person on an electric scale, another person on one of those old school see seesaw scales, um, and then you have somebody doing it based on somebody just looking at them and guessing it, you're not going to then put that all together and say, those are the same type of measurement that we're right. doing, doing here. And so this family therapy does have components to it. Um, active ingredients in the therapy that these therapists are doing in order to get from A to Z. Right, right. And what, what we showed, um, you know, we did a study, it uh, came out in, in the Journal of uh, uh, Consulting and Clinical Psychology. Um, I forget what what year. It was, you know, late 2010s to early 
yeah, this, somewhere late twenty tens. <laughs> Sorry, I wish I had the exact year on that. But what we were, what, what we found there was that the more of these core elements, the more of those that therapists were delivering, the better the outcomes were in both uh, substance use and uh, externalizing types of behaviors, um, regardless of whether you were using an explicit family focused type of treatment or not. Mm. Yeah. And, um, f- fidelity is just like a, a big word, right? So fidelity means staying true to the treatment. Um, and being a clinician, you could feel like, you know, you start forgetting things, you start over relying on one component of the treatment that you do. And, r- keeping that mind fidelity as a treatment provider, as a principle that you're trying to achieve every day or every week is a really big thing. Uh, checking mm-hmm. in of, am I, am I doing the broad spectrum here? Am I doing all the factors here? Because we're human, right? And human beings forget things. They tend to get biased in doing things a certain way. We get siloed. Um, do you remember the, um, the gorilla um, study with the radiologist? Uh, do you remember that? They, they had You're going to tell me about that one. So they, this was like, I think a great, uh, re- research study on siloing. They, they had radiologists look at imaging, but they had like a little tiny gorilla image of a gorilla that they put in the actual image. Okay. Um, and they looked at how often radiologists miss the little gorilla image in, in the thing. And because what they were saying is that you sort of get a checklist, like you look here and then you look here and then you look here right. and you observe here, but then you, you don't look at the whole thing anymore because you have this way of doing it. And so yeah. a reasonable amount missed the gorilla in the, the imaging because of the siloing. But what, what the message gotcha. here is, is that when you were do when you are an expert and you're doing the same thing over and over again, you get into patterns. Mm-hmm. And when you do those patterns, you forget to look at the whole or look outside of those patterns. And it's just very human. Yeah. Um, yeah. And that, that kind of brings up what, what we've been working on more recently, which is on a broader scale, working directly with therapists, um, teaching therapists to how to track their own fidelity, what they're, how to accurately track uh, what they're doing in session. And we've shown that uh, we can, you know, train therapists how to do these things, particularly the um, uh, family interactions, they become much more uh, reliable at at being able to detect these things. Um, So, so helping uh, families, or excuse me, teaching therapists to be able to identify accurately what they're doing in session. Um, and we're, we're working on, uh, what, what, what we showed at this study was that we were really good at, at getting therapists to be able to, um, basically watch clips of, uh, you know, from a session of work being done and identify what specific interventions were happening, then being able to, uh, identify what was happening in their own work, becoming more accomplished at that over time. What we weren't able to get in this study was them doing more of these kind of things. And so that that uh, we, we have a grant application under review now uh, looking to enhance what we're doing there to, um, you know, get therapists not not only be able to sit back and evaluate what they did, but getting them to do more of these uh, things that we know are are related to better outcomes. Yeah, we we need to do this across the different treatment modalities uh, because that's a really great thing. You know, I'm here talking about Fidelity, you know, how many people think about fidelity versus how many people actively push again, back against um, losing fidelity versus yeah. actually, I mean, when I was in grad school, we, we didn't get trained in how to check fidelity uh, yeah. Over, yeah. over time. Yeah. And it seems like a I know really I, I was thing. one of your supervisors. <laughs> you were there. <laughs> you didn't do Where it. was this, Craig? Where was the fidelity? Talk? I know. I know. Uh, but but no, I, I, this, this is all joking aside. Uh, people talk about some people talk about fidelity. Um, but actually training people at the grad school level or even after on a structured way to actually maintain fidelity seems like a lacking thing that we have that that's critically important. Um, yeah. Yeah. And along with that, like you, you see this happening with measurement based care that simply tracking, you know, a client's symptoms over time, 
you, you know, just the, the, the watching and tracking um, and, and keeping track of that, you know, leads to more effective uh, therapy. Um, and I think, you know, more so than, than say, um, we probably should have, should have said at the beginning that uh, y- you came through the program where I'm a faculty member, <laughs> but mm-hmm. um, yeah, I, I, I think um, our, our student clinicians are doing that more now than, you know, when they were say, you know, when you were a student with us. Yeah, I mean, because I, I, I mean, as you could tell, I do this myself because um, I might be a little bit too neurotic on keeping uh, fidelity. I just want to make sure that I'm being effective and I'm, I'm doing the right thing. But there's no structured way of doing it. I'm just doing it in a way that I've surmised in order to have check-ins and see what I'm doing in order to try and do that. So having yeah. some actually structured ways of doing that would would mm-hmm. be, um, yeah. Absolutely. Cool. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we've, we, we've found some success in that area. Um, we just got to, you know, take those next steps of getting them doing it more and then that having an impact on the outcomes. The thing that's notable about this is it's not happening in a supervisory type of setting. Um, you know, it, it's uh, much less direct involvement and, um, you know, there, there aren't the stakes of okay if you're if you're messing up under my supervision uh, there's something i can there's some things that i can do you know about this ultimately you know i can fire you but um so there's not that kind of um direct supervisory uh, relationship that are involved here but it actually reminded me of a point I wanted to make before. So one thing is doing self-check that you're doing mm-hmm. a good mm-hmm. job and that's important and we have to do a lot of that but um you know, I don't think it's going to be too much of a shock to the therapists that are listening, but a lot of therapists have imposter syndrome. Um, I hear it over mm-hmm. and over again mm-hmm. in trainings, mm-hmm. conversations with friends, this fear that um, the other people are doing it correctly. I'm not doing it correctly, and I don't want yeah. people to know that. Uh, so I think then people get scared to um, submit video or go talk mm-hmm. to somebody when they get to a certain point of their profession for someone to check in on how they're doing. And I, I think that's a mistake. Um, yeah. I think, well, number one, you would hope that the person that you're submitting to being a therapist themselves is going to be not super judgmental and mm-hmm. doing it because of the love of, tr- of trying to help people be better at what they are and things like that. So I yeah, think constructive um, and helpful. Yeah. So I think people should get more in the pattern as a field. We should get more in the pattern of having check-ins every now and then with someone that knows more than us or Mm -hmm. being able to go to a certification thing and submit a video for them to critique Mm -hmm. and not our best video. Because when you do a certification like, like the Academy of Cognitive Therapy or Beck Institute or stuff like that, which is, which is a great process, you're trying to get the best video in. So you pass. Yeah, I'm talking about getting video in where you're like, I don't know how well I'm doing here. Can you help me out in doing that better? Like if I was yeah. doing family therapy and me sending it, you know, to you for you to review and say, oh yeah, you could have done this, 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 yeah, this, yeah, yeah. this is looking good. I, I think we should be doing more of that as a field. Yes, I, I agree with that. And, and, you know, that's what we're doing here on a, uh, you know, more systematic type of basis and, you know, a, a regular schedule. Um, but yeah, I, I, I I, I, I just signed up for the ABIT process. Uh, oh, so congratulations. I'm going to be doing this uh, for myself as well. So, yeah. Um, and you can probably feel that imposter syndrome triggering. I've <laughs> been to sit a in bit. front of people yeah. and tell them the Definitely. research you know Definitely. and they're experts in the field. Well, I, I mean, being a, yeah. a good anxiety uh, uh, therapist as uh, you are, I mean, you feel the anxiety and you step into it anyway, right? Mm-hmm. I got that right. Yeah. I mean, part of the reason why I, I started the podcast was actually a bit of an exposure for myself, um, for my own imposter syndrome. You know, I'm going to come out here, I'm going to put my expertise on the line, have conversations with people that probably are going to know more than me and tell them, and you could say I'm wrong and I'm going to put it out there for people to know that that I, I was wrong. Um, and so, yeah, so I think these are healthy behaviors to do anyway, which is like get the certification, putting yourself out there. Um not be so scared of other of not so scared of the fear that other people are going to think you don't know what you're talking about. Right. Right. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. And I, I, I've, um, you know, followed your podcast and I think you modeled that well here. So good mm-hmm. on you, man. 
Well, thank you. Um, all right. Well, the, the last thing I want to get to you before we wrap up was, and I probably should have looped this in in the beginning, but we're talking about this increased tick in depression, anxiety, teens, mental health issues, and then also substance use. Um, what, what's going on as a nation? Like, what are the initiatives going on that are trying to help that? So just in case someone's listening, they're like, okay, great. Well, wh- wh- where can maybe I plug into in order to get some some resources here? Yeah. So, so I mentioned, um, the research network that we're involved with. Um, uh, we are one of, I, I believe there's eight who, who were funded, uh, to set up research networks across the country. Um, you know, specifically to treat substance use and, and to, try to have some kind of impact uh, on the uh, problem of opioid use that, that we see now and the people who are dying uh, from this. So um, uh, this is happening under a broad umbrella of, of uh, the NIH or Nation, National Institutes of Health in general, and uh, in particular, the National Institute on Drug Abuse. So they, the uh, NIH has started this HEAL initiative uh, which stands for uh, helping to end addiction long term. So, um, part of what is going on here is funding these research networks and trying to establish these collaborations of researchers across the country. We're involved in one. Our uh, specific um, angle is uh, family based. So, uh, getting more uh, family based treatments. Um, you know, making them more accessible there, uh, developing them in certain ways, you know, like we were talking about earlier to work with um, older age groups. So emerging adults, um, you know, uh, working on um, uh, opioid use specifically, which uh, hasn't been something I've been directly involved in uh, much through my my career. Um, there are a number of other, th- so um, have uh, colleagues at East Tennessee State University who are working uh, with folks in the uh, Appalachian uh, areas, um, have uh, folks out uh, Pacific Northwest at the um, uh, Oregon um, Social Learning Center, o- o- SLC, uh, who are taking it from a perspective of justice involvement, but also one thing that's really cool there is they're looking at bringing in people with um, lived experience. Um, Journal of Substance uh, Abuse Treatment just uh, within the last few months published an article that was a firsthand view of a postdoctoral fellow at that place um, and his struggles with substance use through his life. Very unique piece. First thing I've seen in an academic journal like that. Um, mm. So uh, you, you you have NIDA is you you have the um, Heal Initiative. Uh, you have the research networks of of which we're a part of. Um, there is a um, initiative called J Coin which is working with people in uh, justice, um, with justice justice involvement. So there, there's lots of, you know, research support that's going to, you know, these broader, uh, more collaborative types of studies. So that, uh, you know, it's an exciting development, something that I, I, I'm really glad to be a part of. Um, and, and I know that you had mentioned um, before the show that you wanted to talk briefly about uh, the partnership to end addiction and, and cars and, and what they're about. Yeah. So uh, under uh, underneath that, so there were five of these research networks that were uh, funded initially. Um, the, the PI of ours, Aaron Hogue, kind of stepped out and, and with – you know, very, you know, a lot of openness and willingness from um, Ashley Shado and uh, their their group out in the Northwest, um, uh, Bettina Hepner and John Knight at uh, Harvard and their Recovery Research Institute developed what we call the Consortium on Addiction Recovery Support. 
or coars. Okay. Um, we have a, a website out there called, uh, you can do a search on it. It's C O A R S recovery. And you'll be able to turn that up pretty quickly. Um, uh, that that's actually reminds me of kind of a more unique angle where we're taking here. We, what I've been involved with previously has mainly focused on the active treatment episode and, and then also what, what happens after treatment. But, um, you know, there, there is a lot that, that is happening in, in terms of recovery support and, and uh, Bettina Hepner and John Knight are some of the first who were, you know, doing, uh, you know, some really good work in this area, looking at recovery over a life course. So what, what's involved past treatment to, you know, go on to include, um, well, just a number of uh, uh, different areas uh, leading to recovery support. So, um, so that, that, that's been, so, Sorry, I, I'm kind of losing the track here, but uh, coerce, um recovery support, uh, that, that would be one place to look. Also, I, I'm, you know, as I encounter people in, in uh, my life outside of the work that I do, just kind of in, you know, day to day interactions, people who are having struggles with, um, you know, say they have a child who's abusing substances or something like that. Um Partnership to End Addiction has some um, direct to family uh, services that are really top notch. Uh, to, to find those, um, uh, you can do a search on partnership to end addiction. And um, I believe the uh, link there is something like Get Help or something like that. But they have a number of direct to family services. They, uh, inter interact with people with, um, uh, through text message, through, uh, telephone, like the, you know, crisis helpline, uh, text messages. They have, uh, some people can opt into, uh, automated text types of programs. They have some parent coaching types of things going on. And as people come to me, um, you know, I, I, I point them, to those resources. I think they're very well done. Okay. Well, we'll definitely have links of them in the show notes for anybody Great. that's interested in, in checking them out there. So just pop in there. There'll be Craig's bio, a little bit about the show, even though you just listened to it. And then on the bottom of that, you'll see some links for some of these resources that Craig just talked about. Um, Thank you so, for that, Jason. Yeah, no, not, not a problem. So before uh, we jump off here, any last words or thoughts or thinking that you feel like the audience should know? Yeah, be, be mindful about and um, aware of what, what our kids are going through and what those parents of those kids are, are, are going through. Um, you know, there may or may not be a way you can directly influence, but uh, kindness, support, and love go a long way. So... Be nice oh. to people. <laughs> yeah, I, I think that's a beautiful message. For, for we're all just nicer to each other. Uh, oh man, I would love to talk about another study, but, um, uh, but, 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 but basically, um, off that comment, the, the way that our society is structured and how we treat each other has a major impact on our physical and mental health. Um, and just this component of being kinder to one another uh, is is really just a beautiful overarching component of how we as a society could be healthier. Uh, yeah. And I will leave it at that. Uh, thank you, Craig, so much for coming on the show and, and spending uh, your, your time with us. All right. You're welcome, Jason. Thank you for allowing me to be here. It's always great to see you and keep up your great work.